Thanks everybody for coming to Burgas and welcome to this second panel uh, of the conference where we are going to be focusing on um, the aspects of our work mainly on, on the European level and also analyzing the results and the lessons learned from this uh, exciting, long-lasting project. And I would like to, to invite the panelists to join us. Yveta is already here. Simon is, is joining. I owe Simon an apology because I changed slightly the title of uh, his presentation and he slightly but substantially <laughs> he had to work it all over. I really apologize for that. Um, I'm very glad to hear that we have over Zoom Margherita, who is in Strasbourg, and uh, we are waiting for hot news from her in a few minutes. And Robert, who is, I guess, in Iceland, he unfortunately couldn't make it. Yeah, he's, he's nodding his head, so he's in Iceland. So, Margherita, my, a very quick question for you. Are you available another 30 minutes? Because we want to start as, okay, okay, she, she agrees then. Then, without further ado, and because Margarita is on a very tight schedule today, as I think I've told everybody, uh, there is this really important event today, and I don't know, I'm, I'm, I must probably change my, my job into a fortune teller or something, because I had no idea this would be on the 12th of September when we were planning the final event in, in Burgas. It turns out we are on the, right on the, on the day when we need to be, when we're waiting for news from Strasbourg. Uh, so, without further ado, let's, uh, let's go uh, into the core of this uh, second panel where we have just a few selected presenters and then well, the plan is to give a little bit more time for interaction with everybody else uh, here sitting around in, in the audience to analyze our work. Uh, but I will start with, with Iveta, who is, um, as you know, um, she has sent everybody the, the comparative analysis of the crowdsourcing to everybody and I will just ask her now to present to everyone uh, the main findings. Iveta, just give me a second to, I think, uh, which one is your presentation? It's going to be a little bit tec technically complete, uh, complicated, this one, so please bear with me. We have two people on... on um, on Zoom and people here presenting. Yes, that's the one. Okay, so please, Iveta, you have the floor and welcome. You are the latest arrival. <laughs> You're just coming straight from the airport. So, yeah, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Petko. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I just wanted uh, uh, to ask a technical question. How will I be able to move between slides? Uh, you just tell me next time. Okay. That's, <laughs> okay. that's the technical, um, I mean. As uh, Petko uh, said that uh, we need to allocate enough time for, uh, for questions and discussions, and there are five panelists, and I'll try to be as brief as possible, but on the other hand, I would also like to give those of you who are not familiar with the project uh, the general context of the project as well. That's why we will quickly skip through several, uh, sev several slides, and I, of course I will focus my remarks on uh, what are the main uh, findings. But Petko, if you could uh, go to the next slide. Okay, it's not that visible, but basically, what you should uh, uh, <laughs> what you should get uh, from uh, from from this slide is that basically it was quite an ambitious project. Um, to put it mildly, ten um, ten uh, different cities across Europe. Uh, you already saw those cities uh, in the previous session. Uh, where Petko also said uh, to what extent Burgas stood out from the rest, and I agree. It's also my assessment, but I will uh, focus on it a bit. Uh, uh, later. Um, it was uh, innovative in the sense that there are not that many crowdsourcing um, activities online that are happening, neither in Europe nor in other countries. And it took the whole year, basically. There were four stages and it took the whole year. If you could move to the next slide. Um, 
And uh, the main objective was not only to understand what's happening in the minds of citizens with air quality, how would uh, citizens of those 10 cities propose to improve air quality, but also um, to test uh, different means of civic engagement uh, in the process. So that was the objective. And now, Petko, if you could uh, switch to the next slide. Mm, okay, and that's the final one that I wanted uh, to show you before we move um, to the main part of my presentation. Namely, there were four platforms. Uh, the first of one uh, you are not really seeing on, uh, on, on the screen uh, because it was uh, just a survey where people could respond to questions on air quality, pinpoint what their problems in their particular cities are. And that platform was used to collect uh, those initial ideas from people. Then during the second stage, there was a dedicated platform. You see a bit of it from on, on, on the screen uh, that basically uh, what happened there where people were um, uh, choosing uh, different, uh, different uh, solutions. And in the third platform, people had the opportunity to prioritize between uh, solutions. And on, during the fourth stage, um, there were already 10 uh, main ideas um, collected in the form of proposals, but they were not polished yet. So what uh, people did uh, in all 10 cities, uh, they were proposing their own amendments, discussing them. Um, that was basically the process. Uh, you will hear much more about it uh, during this panel, but let's go now to, the, to, to, to straight uh, to my main conclusions. So the last slide. Okay. okay. So what are the six things that I think are uh, most important uh, taking into account experience of this project? First of all, historical experience and also uh, context matters. In those cities which had long-standing problems with air quality, um, I, Overall, uh, this experiment uh, turned out to be more successful than in others. Also, it, uh, such uh, factors can influence um, uh, the success of citizen participation uh, also in a more negative way. Namely, if there are some issues that totally overshadow um, um, everything <laughs> connected to different uh, but not as important topics in the minds of uh, citizens, then it's quite hard to attract much uh, civic attention to that particular problem. For example, in my own country, I'm from Latvia, but also in Estonia, uh, it was hard, uh, quite hard to convince uh, citizens to pay attention to uh, air quality at the time where Russia had invaded Ukraine and our societies were also uh, feeling threatened by possible invasion uh, from from Russia. So uh, external context does matter and history also matters. Um, the second um, uh, thing that I would like to mention is the responsiveness of public authorities. Um, those cities uh, we, which either had uh, public authorities that were very welcoming to public initiatives, and I think Burgas here serves as a very nice example, but not just uh, Burgas, also uh, Tallinn, in some ways, uh, Riga, Brussels, uh, uh, Brussels maybe especially, the um, uh, citizens uh, feel that there is more sense in them allocating some time for civic engagement and the process overall uh, maybe runs uh, smoother. It does not necessarily mean that more citizens win will engage, but the atmosphere uh, for um, um, making sense of what citizens are even doing is definitely improved in such circumstances. Um, Conclusion number three, organizer capacity definitely matters. Um, in our context, um, this project, as I said, was highly ambitious and organizers um, basically needed different kinds of capacities to be able to run such a project um, for a whole year. Uh, it's not only uh, capacity to organize information campaigns, but also to be technically skilled. Also, we needed to coordinate on environmental issues because not all of those uh, organizations that were participants of this project uh, were ever, uh, had ever worked uh, with environmental issues. So basically for those um, organizations that had at least some of those capacities, 
uh, it, uh, it, it was much easier to do, which is again uh, something to keep in mind for the next projects. But on the other hand, uh, it was not something that was totally prohibitive if you lack uh, some kind of capacity as, a, as an organizer. For example, again, now let's return to Burgess case. From what I know, ProInfo has not really been involved in environmental issues uh, so much before, but it, uh, it has uh, great capacity in organizing uh, information campaigns and also uh, working with decision makers, so it, 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 it compensated for that uh, more than enough. So it's, uh, it's a conclusion, but it's a bit uh, complicated con conclusion because uh, um, it depends, <laughs> basically, on who is the organizer and which capacities are crucial for a particular project. Um, uh, conclusion number four uh, is that uh, basically we were experimenting with four different platforms and overall it went well. But the overall, um, overall impression, both from participants and also organizers, is that uh, if somebody were to repeat this kind of crowdsourcing experiment, um, it would probably make sense to uh, make one uh, user platform um, so that uh, people are not confused that they need to jump from one platform to another throughout the whole year. But uh, those uh, uh, platforms that we uh, had basically were evaluated by citizens as quite user-friendly and understandable. So this is something that further initiatives uh, really should pay attention to. Uh, one lesson from uh, our experimental uh, um, ex um, initiative is that if you can avoid making four different platforms, uh, please do so. We did not really have choice uh, for different reasons, but it would be a nice uh, thing to have. But overall, paying attention to functionalities of, uh, of, of platforms uh, where crowdsourcing is happening definitely is a good thing. Um, um, there are different strategies for enhancing uh, crowdsourcing experience and maybe something that we did not really expect in the very beginning when launching this project is to what extent it makes sense to not only focus on online events but also organize face-to-face -face discussions, meetings. Uh, they add a lot of value to what's happening uh, online, especially for those non-governmental organizations, activists, also policy makers um, who are deeply interested in the subject matter. For them, um, what's happening online is not always deep enough, so they benefit out of uh, having those opportunities to grow their networks, get some more um, cooperation from other parties, and uh, it also, for some cities, uh, definitely draw uh, more traffic to the website, um, more ideas than if it had only been done uh, on uh, uh, in online space. So that's uh, something to be taken into consideration. Also, uh, having good partnerships uh, with civic activists uh, active in that uh, specific field is uh, very, very, very helpful. This is also that we see when comparing 10 cities. And the last but not least, um, um, of course, focusing on policy impact is also important. Uh, we will hear from Margarita shortly about what the main um, uh, crowdsourcing, uh, sorry, advocacy efforts are happening in Brussels right now as a result of this project. But in several cities, um, um, especially in Brussels, uh, but also from what I've heard in Burgas, that during the last session, decision makers are very open and uh, have been very receptive towards those suggestions that citizens developed uh, for their own cities. So uh, we expect that this project will have uh, an impact not only on European Union level, uh, Margarita will tell more, but also what we are seeing that at least uh, for those cities where there are good cooperation between organizers and, and decision makers and there's interest on behalf of decision makers, um, um, impact um, uh, of, uh, of the project uh, can, al uh, can also be seen in policy-related terms, or at least uh, we, we see that uh, policy makers have paid attention and have um, incorporated those ideas in their public speeches or in their proposals for the future. So that's very shortly about uh, the main conclusions from this uh, ambitious initiative. Thank you, Iveta. Uh, I think the best thing for us to do now is to go straight to, to Strasbourg 
and I hope that Margarita can hear us. Uh, we're all ears to, to find out what's going on with uh, uh, the citizens' proposals gathered under Cold Europe and DigiDem uh, during the discussion preparation for the vote for the uh, ambient air quality directive. So, Margarita, if you can hear us, if you can hear us, yes. uh, the floor is yours. I hear you very well, and I hope you do as well. You hear me, right? Yes, please go yes, ahead. Please go yes, ahead. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks for uh, making this possible, Petro. I'm really happy to be able to share some updates from this very session that you said uh, is really crucial for the, the work uh, we have been doing in the past years in relation to air quality and to make sure that MEPs are understanding citizens' priority. I, I was really happy that ED was part of this effort. Uh, this crowdsourcing exercise has actually confirmed that uh, the general population and specific uh, urban population has a great interest in uh, air quality related issues. Uh, and they have an understanding also about what can be done to solve those issues. What we have uh, been doing specifically in the past months after the policy recommendations were being uh, formulated was to distribute those recommendations, uh, highlighting the legitimation of those lines, given that they are uh, the result of a, a very structured uh, crowdsourcing um, project and therefore um, giving the real sense about the credibility and the uh, ownership of those recommendations by uh, citizens and how MEPs should somehow feel uh, obliged to consider them when positioning themselves in this uh, very important vote. So today there will be a debate at uh, starting at 1 and the air quality session is supposed to be starting at 2 p.m. Uh, you can follow it online as well. So if you are curious, uh, not to overlap with this event, obviously, but you might keep an eye on what they are discussing. And then the vote is happening tomorrow at noon. What would be useful is to relaunch the policy recommendation to social media channels. Uh, if you have them, what we have done as well was to print uh, copies of those recommendations and to, leave, uh, to deliver at hand to some MEPs and also to deliver uh, um, some of those copies to the assistants to make sure that there is an understanding about the fact that there is a clear interest from the public in securing action on, on, on this issue. I, I think, to be honest, uh, these, or the results of the crowdsourcing are, are perfectly in line with also what uh, bigger statistics have um, showed. We have seen a recent Eurobarometer uh, exercise um, resulting in citizens putting public health protection as the first priority for the next round of European election, coming first even uh, respect to uh, climate, meaning that any kind of product that is made available to support the need for action on air quality is actually uh, very useful. There is a good momentum, unfortunately maybe COVID has also offered this uh, window of opportunity. Still, despite this public interest and huge need for action on public health, there are some political groups which are not aligned with this and still have a very conservatory, conservative approach in, um, on the topic. Obviously, you might have uh, followed the last negotiation on different pieces of legislation, including the Industrial Emissions Directive. By the way, industry is one of the sources on which citizens have expressed uh, an interest for uh, better action. Um, where there were, uh, especially European um, People's Party, positioning themselves as a very far right and destroying everything which is connected to the environment. That's not what we expect from, from this historically center position party and uh, usually interested in doing <laughs> better than what they are now, I think. Uh, so in, in Strasbourg this week as well, we are trying to understand what the size of the issue with EPP. We are trying to understand if there will be some support for uh, the text uh, resulting from this vote, which will be then 
um, the piece of paper that the parliamentary representatives will be bringing in trilogues, meaning uh, after the parliament uh, position, there will be the council taking a position towards the end of the year, and they will be sitting council, parliament, and commission together to agree on a compromise text. Uh, I do think that the work we have done with this um, project is really going to be very meaningful for the upcoming at least six to ten months. So I really invite everybody to keep using the policy recommendation to keep launching and relaunching them on social media. Please tag your MEPs, tag your national ministries, and continue the, the, the great work you have done up to now to, to secure visibility to the effort that was conducted and also to, to the results. That would be my main recommendation. And I'm happy to have some questions still for 10, 15 minutes. We know how pressed for time you are. So a brief round of questions probably to you before, before Margarita has to go down, uh, you know, away from, from this call. So anybody who wants to, to, to ask a question, please go ahead. So uh, when we will be able to know what would be the outcome? of the today's meeting, because it starts at 2, so would you send us a message, a very quick text, after it's over? Uh, today, today there is the debate, so there is no real outcome, it's more listening into what political groups are expressing in public, while the vote is scheduled for tomorrow at noon, and I think it can go really quick. By 1, we should be able to get a result about the, um, the parliament position on the air quality file. And we will for sure be uh, publishing a press release probably a bit later, but I will, um, I will share it with the, the partners so you can have an idea about what is happening. But you can also follow Twitter. I think that's more an immediate uh, channel for understanding what is happening. Thank you, perfect. Could you tell us what is the most controversial issue on debate right now? Yeah, there is. Uh, yes, I think the, the most uh, politicized topic at this case, society uh, are all pushing for having the recommendations that uh, the WHO has issued in 2021 to be reflected in, into the legislation, meaning aligning the air quality standards of the European Union with what WHO is recommending. Uh, that was agreed in the MV committee report, meaning the specific committee um, of the European Parliament dealing with environmental uh, legislation has agreed on a suggested disposition for the full European Parliament. And this is also what is going to be voted tomorrow, uh, meaning uh, should we have uh, a European Parliament calling for WHO by 2030, there is also an amendment on the table for 2035, and there are other political groups completely uh, wanting to kill any WHO reference and to postpone uh, action on this, so to have higher, much higher level of concentrations to be allowed. I think that's the main, uh, uh, the main topic under discussion. Then there will be some more specific legal aspects, like can we secure access to justice, and in fact, this is also very relevant for Bulgaria, because Bulgaria is one of the countries where there is uh, still uh, no access to justice if people want to challenge public um, authorities for not having achieved air quality objectives, and though all the cases are dismissed because there is no legitimate interest, and this is against uh, EU legislation because there is, in any case, a law which is uh, allowing citizens to have access to justice to demand action when legislation is in place. And this air quality proposal, which is on the table, is also aiming at clarifying further these obligations for public authorities. And that is also where we have some resistances from some countries, obviously. So I would mention this too. Thank you. I just wanted to update you. We had a member of parliament in the first panel, uh, and uh, she's a member of the environmental committee, and uh, she did say that amendments to the Bulgarian law exactly in this segment, which is about uh, uh, the ability of citizens to challenge decisions, uh, are being debated right now. And she, she said that's high on her agenda, or apparently on the uh, you know, parliamentary legislatory agenda mm -hmm. of, of her group to be included in, in this session of parliament. So we're hoping for improvements there. 
I'm not sure. Did we lose Margarita? Maybe we did. No, I'm still. Here. Oh, okay, okay, still here. Anybody else has no, any I, questions? I heard, I heard what you said. Yeah. But thanks. Okay. Anybody has any questions for Margarita? Okay, thanks. We really appreciate this, finding the time and all your work, so thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you for making it possible, Petko. Thanks, thanks. And hi to all, even if I didn't, uh, I don't see you, but I know you're there, so. Good luck, good luck from everybody. Good luck. Thanks, bye-bye. Thanks a lot, thanks. thanks a lot, bye. All right, well, um, I think this was uh, really something uh, very, very interesting, interesting and important and for us to hear. Now, uh, I, I will probably need a, a few seconds to find uh, Alsek Vrakova's presentation, but I was thinking to make, uh, um, or maybe we could go with, with Robert first, yes, yes and, then, and then continue with you. But I was just thinking that even if it's Robert, it's the same uh, transition that I wanted to suggest making. We've been talking mainly about the environment and, and air quality this whole day and for very good reasons, but uh, now it's time to switch a little bit the focus to the other key component of our project, which is e-participation and crowdsourcing. And from here on, I was just actually a little bit sad that we didn't have the time to ask this from the MEPs and, and, and uh, uh, the city officials here, but I, we are going to follow up with them as an organization. But this is, I mean, we could, we could talk about the environment all day long and it will be very, very interesting. But let's go back to this aspect of our crowdsourcing, using uh, the, uh, you know, the, the wisdom of the crowd and different other ways of e-participation and look at our project and the results of our project and the ways ahead uh, from the perspective of the technology, from the perspective of the, of the policy, uh, you know, methodology of, of en engaging citizens in, in co-deciding co with policy makers. So maybe you could really start with Robert, if you're there, Robert? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Okay, then we're listening. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, thank you. and. Uh, it's really great to uh, hear that uh, you know recommendations are uh, so topical in terms of uh, you know being uh, um, you know uh, I mean obviously air quality you know is topical because it is a real problem you know I mean that's for sure and uh, so I'm really happy uh, you know that uh, you know our recommendations uh, that are coming through this process are uh, you know getting a, a, you know, some play and uh, getting some wings and getting somebody uh, that is listening to them. That's great. But because that's uh, in the end, uh, having been working on uh, on crowdsourcing, on engaging citizens online uh, yeah, since 2008, when we started the Citizens Foundation in Iceland, you know, the, the key element of any crowdsourcing project and uh, the reason for any project is, is the outcome. You know, we, uh, um, you know, I think that's something that uh, we have certainly learned over the years um, that uh, it, it is easier to get citizens to participate in something. They believe that, uh, you know, the outcome or what their work uh, in taking part in the exercise will be used for something uh, positive or something constructive. And that can take many, many forms. And, uh, uh, but I'm really pleased that, uh, you know, the hard work of the, Thousands of people who, uh, you know, took part uh, in all the different stages across all the different uh, cities is actually uh, being listened to, because that's not a given. Uh, we've, uh, you know, heard about, uh, seen uh, crowdsourcing projects where, you know, even, um, you know, the idea was basically just to, um, you know, sort of satisfy some, uh, some promotional need of uh, being open, but, uh, uh, but the results are not being listened to. I think that, uh, and also for us as a non-profit civil society organization, I think that's, uh, you know, I mean, really, you know, that's like one of the things that we are most pleased about this project is that, you know, the recommendations from citizens are actually going somewhere, you know, and through those different uh, channels and, uh, yeah, even uh, even to Strasbourg. So, so, so we're, we're, we're really pleased with that. Um, Iveta started, to, you know, talked a little bit about... Uh, uh, the four different phases, and uh, and I'm just going to sort of revisit that a little bit. 
Uh, so one of the things that uh, us and other practitioners have learned over the years that uh, uh, engagement for outsourcing projects, uh, you know, you can design them in all sorts of different ways. Uh, but one of the things that we've learned is that uh, uh, having different stages that are dealing with different aspects of the of the crowdsourcing decision making or whatever it is can often be uh, very beneficial and the start, uh, and one of the uh, sort of you know well uh, understood uh, much used uh, patterns in this is to identify you know to first to identify the problems as we did in uh, in in stage one um, you know of code europe in the in the first phase of the crowdsourcing is to identify the problems and uh, and uh, and that was really interesting to see what came out of that. Uh, I mean, it's a relatively simple exercise in terms of um, we just want uh, to hear about, you know, what are the problems that their quality are causing people. And then uh, uh, sort of coming from that uh, for the second phase, uh, and that was actually where we were most involved uh, with our open source, your priorities software. We we look at the, the problems that have been identified and uh, and uh, and start to uh, collect solutions, uh, potential solutions, recommendations of uh, how can we improve air quality from many different uh, levels. Um, what, one of the complexities uh, in this project, uh, but also that's reflecting reality is that uh, uh, air quality and air is so fluid. I mean, the air just like, yeah, it just flows all over the place, you know, like without borders and, and all of that. and. Uh, the question of air quality is not only a, a you know, a question of uh, what decision makers do in one city or one town, or one region or one country, um, and even on the European level, which is really great that uh, air quality is being uh, uh, discussed there. Um, you know, that's uh, yeah. You know, I think that's really, really important because air quality is one of those issues that are. You know, it is both local, but it's also global. You know, you can feel the effect locally, but uh, to actually tackle it, you need a much uh, <clears throat> wider range of, uh, you know, decision makers to take part in it. So this was, when it comes to the crowdsourcing, this was one of the sort of maybe more complex things is, you know, who should the recommendation to be? Who, who you know, who are you um, offering as a citizen? You're taking part in one of the, you know, 10 cities, you know, uh, in in phase two uh, doing solutions uh, who should be the one uh, is the local uh, people in the local council in the city or or and uh, obviously you know we always had the goal of having our recommendations uh, flow uh, to the environmental uh, um, you know environmental bureau and uh, and obviously we're very pleased with that. But it's also been important in this project that um, you know decision maker on all, all different levels are sort of listening in on this. And then on the phase three, um, after we have collected the uh, solutions, we uh, um, you know we were prioritizing the uh, solutions. What are the most uh, important recommendations uh, uh, when it comes to air quality? Because that's also one of the uh, key critical factors of a, of a crowdsourcing uh, uh, project is that, you know, there, there can often be a lot of recommendations or rec a lot of solutions that are, uh, pr you know, provided, but, and often like, you know, hundreds or even thousands or whatever. So, so, so being able to prioritize uh, uh, the solutions, uh, you know, you know, was a really imp important sort of third step in this process. And then the fourth uh, sort of final step of the crowdsourcing, where we were actually working with uh, crowdsourcing in sort of smaller groups uh, to actually sort of co-write the, the recommendations after having gone through this sort of whole process of, uh, of uh, problems, uh, solutions, recommendations, prioritization, and then sort of to actually uh, flesh out the recommendations to, uh, um, you know, make them sort of most... Uh, relevant for the audience and uh, uh, we obviously were uh, you know as a uh, as a partner for one of the funding countries as sort of looking at this uh, 
an expert partner in crowdsourcing. We've been following all all four stages along, and and you know it's been really good to uh, uh, see uh, see that it all worked. Because as uh, Iveta said, uh, I mean, as a research project, it was a really good idea. I, I think you know to get so many different uh, you know European partners together, uh, and we were using four different platforms. And I think uh, for the it's for, for the different you know states of the crowdsourcing. I think because Code Europe was not only purely an action project in terms of uh, the project was not only about uh, you know actually generating the recommendations i mean we could i mean the project could have just been about generating the recommendations and then we would probably have thought about it a little bit differently but this project was to also learn about crowdsourcing in europe how do we uh, sort of make that work so so so, so if i probably agree with the recommendation as uh, as if, you know as you had mentioned earlier that that it would probably be easier if we were doing a project like that that was just about the recommendations to generate the recommendation it would be easier to use four platforms i know it's too easy to use one platform uh, we did, did learn uh, you know quite a bit on uh, on uh, on using all the different uh, platforms and and that uh, uh, you know has uh, you know uh, all those learnings you know i don't think that if you just had one platform we've learned as much as we did that then uh, sort of has filtered in through uh, you know both the recommendations you know but also the really really uh, uh, you know which, which i think is quite um, you know like one of the mo like most exciting parts of this project is the uh, you know is the framework to evaluate uh, how successful those sort of projects are because that's something that is uh, as i say we've been doing this for a long time we've been you know working with the city of Reykjavik for example for 2010 we work with 20 municipalities in iceland we work with the scottish parliament you know world bank and we have projects in 45 countries, and uh, you know there is a, uh, a you know there is a great need to uh, sort of keep on you know expanding and learning about those processes you know and uh, and uh, like some of the projects um, you, you know our partners uh, do or they use our platforms I mean could really do with a more do with more retrospective you know more you know you know you know internal uh, like viewing of, of of how things are going so you know so having this framework to evaluate projects i think that's really useful and we are i mean definitely going to uh, promote that uh, aspect of code europe uh, you know to our partners you know because uh, yeah because i mean that's really uh, you know you know how we learn i mean for example for the city of reykjavik we have had uh, uh, we have worked with like 10 different project managers, you know, since 2010. In a way, our small nonprofit is a bit of a, a memory bank for the city of Reykjavik in terms of how the participation processes work, uh, which is okay, which is fine. But uh, but we very much with the city of Reykjavik and others, you know, to um, try to help them to formalize, you know, more of a, um, an intentional sort of a learning experience, including doing uh, analysis of results, uh, and uh, sort of, you know, documenting things and so on and so on. So that was sort of a quick sort of overview of the crowdsourcing. I mean, the, the only, uh, you know, the only thing I was missing, you know, from Code Europe and in terms of the scope of the project was uh, a bigger marketing budget. I mean, who doesn't want to have a bigger marketing budget always? Uh, but... Uh, but you know, as uh, I'm sure is in some reports, I mean, we have been. Uh, this has been one of our big cons big concerns over uh, yeah decades. You know, we've been running our nonprofit for 15 years. I mean, it's always been really challenging. You know, if you have a project like this, how are you going to let the citizens know about it? How will they know that they can participate? And uh, and I was actually quite funny, but uh, you know, I was thinking about the other day, like when we started with the city of Reykjavik. Um, when they launched uh, Better Reykjavik, you know, to all the citizens of Reykjavik, back in 2010, there was like two newspapers, you know, like you remember those old things where you were like, you know, pages, you would like fl flip them around and look at the stuff inside. Anyway, you know, 10 years ago, there was like two newspapers like that in Iceland. No, no, in Reykjavik. And the city government bought full page ads in each of those newspapers. And at, at the start of Better Reykjavik, Almost everybody in the city knew about the project. They they noticed it from those newspapers. Now, 2023, there are no newspapers anymore. Zero. I mean, there is one, but it's like a private, well, it's like a, it's a, it's a subscription. Very few people have it. But, but now today, 
if the city of Reykjavik wants to let citizens know about it, you know, they have to use all the means. And, uh, um, and that, you know, you know, well, like one of the things is like, uh, uh, you know, I mean, obviously there are many methods and, uh, you know, many different ways of, you know, promoting things. But the thing is that, um, you know, sadly, then the most effective way is to actually pay Facebook or Meta or Twitter or other to buy social media advertisement. And the why is it sad? Because, you know, before this, like only, as I say, 15, no, you know, 13 years ago when we launched, uh, you know, Better Reykjavik, like the gatekeepers in terms of who, who was uh, keeping the attention of citizens, it was totally distributed around the whole planet. You know, I mean, in in uh, in all your different countries, there was newspapers. There was all sorts of yes, gatekeepers, but they were there. They were local. But now the gatekeepers, basically, the 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 owners of the products that most of us are using, uh, you know, those are the new gatekeepers, and they are like global, and they are only just a handful of people, like the richest people in the world, like Elon Musk. You know, so I said that's the reason why it's sad and why it's a bit. You know, it's 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 difficult for democracy that we have those gatekeepers. You know, but as I say, I mean, uh, you know, I think we did really well with the promotion in uh, in Code Europe, given that we didn't have a very uh, that, you know dedicated marketing, a big dedicated sort of marketing budget for each of the different crowdsourcing pilots. But we had a little bit. Um, you know, we uh, experimented. You know, a little bit with our own money. Uh, you know, to promote. Uh, uh, the phase two on Twitter uh, that went really well. We only spent like you know thousand euros or something, twelve hundred, and uh, but that was sort of my only uh, sort of uh, what I'd say about a really well uh, uh, well done process. All four stages we get the good re we get good recommendations out. They go somewhere, so that's a huge success. But the only only thing is that you know I was just to talk a little bit as 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 you know all of you in Code Europe. I, I do tend to talk about the attention economy quite a bit because it's a it's a bit of a thorn in our side. It, it's making us not being able to reach citizens. But but aside from that, then I think uh, you know um, the crowdsourcing exercises were really uh, successful. And, uh, and and just to sort of uh, end with that, then we also did uh, 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 some uh, web uh, listening. Uh, as a part of this with the social media uh, you know social media listening dashboard where we uh, search for uh, pe people's attitudes to air quality from many different angles uh, uh, from information from 2013 to 2022 and that was really interesting uh, and interesting also about because that um, looking at what people were talking about on the web for all those years we were seeing a growing uh, concern about different aspects of air quality which is which is absolutely normal but anyway, if you have any questions, just let me know. Thanks, Robert. Uh, you can stay with us until the end of the panel, right? Yeah, at least until like one o'clock your time. Okay. I need to go okay. Then to the thanks. Uh, Another eighteen we'll, minutes. We'll have around. We'll have a round of comments and questions, and I'm sure that people will come back with more questions. I, I was especially interested in thank you about addressing the marketing aspect of our exercise, which hasn't been uh, mentioned or discussed in any detail today. Thanks. Uh, now, next is Asya Kivrakova from uh, Avikas, who will talk about uh, what do we do next, how do we, what do we do next on the European level, a very, very key aspect, I think, of, of Code Europe, of the Code Europe exercise. Um, how do we go ahead by pushing for this kind of uh, e-participation models to be um, embedded in the way uh, the European Union uh, takes its decisions. I just need a second. Here is Asia, your presentation. And we are ready to go. Please go ahead. Um, yes, I thought we are. That's <laughs> where is it? Here it is. All right. Okay. Can I? Yes, I, please I, go. Please go ahead, the floor is yours. Oh. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so as you know, our role in this project was of an expertise partner in crowdsourcing. And the reason for that is that we have had Zika's long-standing interest in the crowdsourcing method as a citizen engagement method. 
Um, I think you all know who we are. Uh, I also presented shortly the organization at the beginning of, uh, of, of the morning. Uh, we have been studying crowdsourcing since 2015. Uh, as a method which can ensure direct impact of citizens on the EU decision-making process. Uh, and therefore, what I'm going to present is the presentation that more or less I will present to the European decision-makers on the 19th of September. As you know, we have uh, this task under the project. We are gathering in person uh, based on an exclusive invitation, European decision makers and stakeholders. Uh, we are having already 70 registrations, 20 of them are really people from the Commission and the Parliament and other relevant bodies who are interested in crowdsourcing as a method, not only for uh, legislation, but also for other purposes. But my, of course, specific task would be to demonstrate the potential of crowdsourcing, uh, for crowdsourcing legislation with citizens, and basically advocating for adding it to the uh, European Union participatory toolbox with citizens. So, um, the only two slides that I'm going to show on the 19th and that are not there, are basically concerning the specificities of the code project with the faces. But just because here we had Yvette who presented them, I decided that there is no need for duplication. So I go straightly, straight to the point. So the conclusions here that I'm going to present are of course largely based on the code and DigiDem project, but not entirely. So they are based on everything that we've done as ICAS to study crowdsourcing since 2015. And those are, uh, ah, Okay, let's go through the definition first, what crowdsourcing is. So digital democracy method that mobilizes the so-called wisdom of the crowd. I mean, I think the most broadly widely used definition of crowdsourcing is this one of Bradham, that crowdsourcing can be defined as an online distributed problem solving and production model that leverages the collective intelligence of online communities to serve specific organizational goals. In our specific context, in terms of crowdsourcing legislation with citizens, it means connecting and solving problems online with people that you otherwise would not engage with. So this is the bottom line of crowdsourcing for our purposes. Uh, here is our work since 2015, which started with analysis of 27 uh, case studies of crowdsourcing around the globe. Uh, this informed us of the eventual potential of this method to enrich citizens' um, contributions to, to the EU legislation and not only, of course, this was like something that we sense based on, on this analysis, but we needed further studies and also experiments where Code Europe and DigiDem come in order to understand more. So it's all part of a learning process. And I wouldn't say that whatever we I'm going to present today is, is really written in stone. It's just what we know at this stage of our knowledge um, and learning curve, but definitely what we need is to experiment more and further with crowdsourcing. Uh, we did a more thorough analysis of the crowdsourcing of the constitutional reform in Iceland, something which has been mentioned by Robert, as well as the experience of Finland of the off-road traffic law. Uh, we had the EU crowd project, Simon knows very well about it because uh, his organization was leading it, where we uh, implemented a series of events uh, in certain member states, member states which have done crowdsourcing at a certain level, uh, because we wanted to know what is the agenda that citizens want to crowdsource on at the EU level. And this is how we have discovered that it's an education, health and environment. Based on that, we have defined the approach, the methodology, and also the subject of air quality, um, which, as you know, we have experimented uh, in the framework of the Code Europe and DigiDem projects. So in this uh, specific two projects, we have done quite, quite a lot of experimentation. Basically, we experimented with everything. I would even say nowadays that maybe, maybe we went 
too far and it was too much. We tested the platforms, we tested the process, we tested the communication strategy, we tested um, the assessment framework that we developed, we tested it on the crowdsourcing pilot and we tested the, the, the assessment for, uh, framework itself. So a lot of testing and piloting. But at the end of the day, I think also going in line with what Iveta said, we can say that this method has a potential. Uh, this is our conclusion. We think that the engagement method of crowdsourcing policy and legislative solutions with citizens has viable potential to reduce the gap between political elites and citizens through co-deciding, co-decision -de making, uh, just because it brings along citizens' perspectives. Citizens are experts in their everyday life, especially concerning the problems that they experience on a daily basis co uh, close to them. Uh, their perspectives help governments and decision makers to allocate resources where they are most, uh, of most use from citizens' point of view. And this also increases both the legitimacy of the decisions taken and their ownership by citizens. At the end of the day, whatever policy or legislation is made, uh, the final beneficiaries would be citizens. If they do not have ownership of those decisions, it will be also very difficult to make them uh, act accordingly and enforce them. So this sense of ownership and legitimacy is especially important nowadays when we see uh, how much distrust in general citizens have in political elites, which is of course flourishing ground for populism, uh, disinformation and all of the phenomena that we are experiencing nowadays in big times. Um, I particularly like this definition by um, Aitamurtu and Shen, which uh, appears in their pub publication in 2015 about the crowdsourcing and its potential to generate those three values, epistemic value, democratic value and economic value. I think this is particularly important because somehow it summarizes the potential. Of course, whether this potential will be fully utilized and realized would very much depend on how we run the processes. So, from that perspective, uh, we think that we have enough grounds and arguments to make the case that we uh, want decision makers to consider adding crowdsourcing as an institutional embedded in the decision making process at EU level channel uh, for citizens to have an impact. Why? Because all the participation tools that um, exist nowadays uh, are simply do not offer anything like crowdsourcing. Uh, I can explain this in detail because we have analyzed in this publication, which is now in the printing house, it's called Crowdsourcing the Citizens Highway to EU Decision-Making Process. Um, there we analyze very much in detail the European Citizens Initiative, the online consultation, the petitions, um, even the online platform that was used by the EU um, through the Conference on the Future of Europe. Um, but yeah, this is, you can read it afterwards or we can have a discussion if you want to, to know more. Uh, we have a legal basis for this crowdsourcing method and its institutionalization and it's Article 10.3 of the Treaty of the European Union. You see here what it says, every citizen has the right to participate in the democratic life of the EU and decisions should be taken as openly and as closely as possible to the citizens. And we want to add the crowdsourcing to the e-participation democratic toolbox at EU level specifically before the EU public consultations. As you know, the European Commission is obliged to launch consultations with all interested parties every time when it starts to legislate or to develop a policy 
uh, of whatever kind. However, analysis of those few public consultations show that they are very technical, very specific. They are mostly tailored for organized interests, experts, and citizens rarely participate in them, first because they don't know about them, second because it's a limited number of languages in which those consultations are available, third because they are really very technical, and fourth because those consultations are largely based on text that already exists. So we see, we see the crowdsourcing as place in this whole process before the EU public consultation, namely in the agenda setting and policy formulation stage. So first we crowdsource with citizens and then based on their ideas and setting, agenda setting, then we open public consultation designed for organized interests and experts. Of course, whatever we design should be specifically tailored for citizens. We will come a bit later to them because I have come up um, with 15 recommendations, which in my view are the blueprint for the next crowdsourcing uh, project of ours. I wouldn't say it's really the blueprint for everything that will happen in the world of crowdsourcing from now on, because again, I think it's learning by doing each and every time, and this is also why the assessment framework was so important and will be important in the future, so that we adjust every time as we go. But for that moment, the blueprint, in my view, are those 15 recommendations, and this is what we will be putting forward also in our publication. And of course, we need to be very careful uh, on what we crowdsource. So we need to select, of course, an issue and a subject which is dear to citizens, but on the other hand, if we want to have it at EU level and have an impact on EU level, it should be definitely an exclusive or shared competence of the EU. If it's not a competence of the EU, then it wouldn't be a new pilot. Um, so, regulatory legislation, international treaty frameworks, that those should be avoided. Uh, here is the EU crowdsourcing blueprint that I have put together. Five uh, recommendations under uh, three areas. They largely uh, coincide or at least do not contradict with Iveta's recommendations. This is why Iveta, thank you very much. It was so important to see yours so that I, I make sure I do not go <laughs> with something which is not acceptable. Um, so, I mean, definitely guys, one platform. We don't, we don't need more platforms, we should go for one platform. Uh, having all of those uh, characteristics that you see here, intu intuitive, visually appealing, user-friendly, and so on and so forth. Authentication process should be considered very, very carefully from the beginning, really considering, of course, the objective of each phase or overall the exercise, but also the culture of participation of, in each country, because apparently countries differ. Uh, in, in, in the sense that some of them are more willing to share personal data, some others are not. Uh, security, no need to explain why here it's so important. Um, then, yeah, accessibility to disadvantaged groups. Uh, we need to, to think about that in advance. So before designing the process, uh, we need to make, it, make sure it's accessible and this can be done through very many different means, of course. And then multilingualism that can be ensured as we, as we saw through, through different ways. Uh, but anyway, so all of those decisions needs to, be, needs to be taken in advance and embedded in the design of the crowdsourcing platform. In many cases, in our case, it was learning by doing. <laughs> but this, is also, this was also the fascinating uh, thing of the, of the whole experiment. Um, so the participation, uh, the communication, um, strategy should be universal with, with very clear KPIs, but it's very, very clear also that its implementation needs to be decentralized and country specific. This is, this is obvious because we have also different cultures. We have different uh, developments, external, internals that we need to, to take into consideration. The policy topic, as we said, I mean, besides the fact that if you want it to be a new um, a level exercise, it needs to be shared or exclusive EU competence. Um, it also should be appealing to citizens. Um, 
So accessibility and inclusiveness would need, and here, I mean, I cannot agree more with, uh, with Yvette, we will uh, need to, to, to also envisage offline activities. Although crowdsourcing usually is referred only as an online activity, the fact is that nothing is successful if it's entirely and only online. Uh, be it because it wouldn't be accessible enough, uh, be it because uh, basically at the end of the day technology is technology, but activation of participation is done mostly if we want a successful one through offline events. Um, if I mentioned the flexibility to accommodate challenges that we may not know of. I mean, our project was implemented partly under COVID, the, law, the war in Ukraine and many other challenges, if I mentioned some of them. Last but not least, of course, the feedback and the impact. Uh, we need to have commitment to decision makers from the, the start. That's, that, that's clear. In our case, um, we just try to ensure it as we go throughout the process because of many reasons. Because the project was delayed, because we were not sure when it will start, and so on and so forth. But in the ideal case scenario, we need the commitment from the start. And um, definitely the link between local and EU level, I would even at national level is also essential. It makes the, the, the exercise more complicated, but if we want to have a real impact, we need to address all the levels. Because even today, we, for example, heard that, okay, the big polluters, uh, the municipality doesn't have the competencies here to control them, because it's the state job. It's the competency of the state. So, I mean, no matter how many bicycles we have here and how green it is. Um, if the big polluters continue to pollute like this, people will be very unhappy. And the municipality doesn't, I mean, cannot do anything. So we need to have also the involvement of those who are responsible and can take relevant decisions at all levels. Um, yeah, the dissemination strategy should take advantage of major political events. This is always useful to maximize impact. Uh, feedback to citizens. This is something that we need to work more on and we need to have a clear strategy uh, in advance on how we are going to inform citizens about what happens when, who does what. And I mean, it's inevitable that your level, at the EU level, um, the impact, even to figure it out, takes time. It's just the process. You see, now it goes through the parliament, then there will be uh, the council, then there will be the trial walks that will negotiate. I mean, here we go with another two years plus <laughs> after the end of the project. So this is, this is how it is. So we need somehow to, to, to have this understanding and also maybe to convey it very honestly to the citizens from the very beginning that it wouldn't be like this at the end. Um, sufficient human and financial resources. I think this was mentioned by Yvette as well. And then the framework for e-participation. Evaluate, evaluate, assess, learn, carry out a new updated experiment, then assess, learn again and again. Because everything is changing. In the uh, IT world, also in our human world, I mean, we, we live in very, very dynamic times. And we need to be able to grasp all the particularities of the moment and to be prepared for the next ones. Thank you very much. Thank you, Asia. Uh, this was really very comprehensive, and I very much, I think everybody here will have their reactions and questions to you, but I really appreciate this holistic approach that you have taken to this issue. And uh, I think that's a very, uh, a very good place to, to transition to, to Simon, to whom I must um, apologize once again. Uh, and explain a little bit. You know, my, my background is in journalism and we are known to be very superficial and flexible. Begin, you know. <laughs> you know, because you don't know who your next guest will be and you have to be able to adapt to, to whatever they are uh, and who they are. So I thought changing a little bit, you know, a little bit in my perspective, uh, the topic of his presentation as of yesterday is no big deal. But, but of course, we all know that Simon is the big conceptual thinker here. So I, once again, I apologize that he had to rework the entire thing. So uh, please 
excuse me, and, and take the floor. Actually, you downloaded it here. If you could find me, if you could help me find it. Maybe the best thing would be for you to, yeah. yeah. It's on the desktop, okay. Then we can just share it from here. You can just share it from here, it's called. It's here. Um, and I think it's already opened in the slides. Um, if you open slides, and they should be there. Here, this one, no? Cold event program? Yes, yes. Okay. So. This is it, but I but it's not in in Zoom. I want just, to share it. Start, in start, start, uh, yeah. start this. But it will not be shared in Zoom. I'm afraid, like this. Or will it be? Let's see. It is. Can you see it in Zoom? No, no. Sorry. Okay. Hold on a second. Uh, I'm going to find it. If you can start already, I'll, I'll, I'll find it meanwhile. Before. Petco founds a technical solution. Um, thank you, Petco, for, apologi for apologizing. I also wish that the science would be as flexible as journalists, but unfortunately, this is not always the case because uh, the concepts and the models are something that uh, should stand a test of time and it's very hard to be um, flexible sometimes. Um, what I would like to show with this last presentation of this panel is uh, what Petco asked me to share a little bit broader um, views on how crowdsourcing is relating to late list development in e-participation. I have 10 slides with some graphs and so on so for better visualization, but mainly I will talk about three uh, topics. Firstly, I will look um, at the e-participation at this meso general level, which is being covered by the United Nations e-participation index, and also how in my viewpoint, a code project is addressing, contributing to some issues that uh, e-participation research on this um, um, met, met, meta level is having. Then I will go to the meso level, I will look at different models of democracy, how cross-sourcing is being embedded in those um, um, discussions about democracy and also how code project itself is contributing uh, to this level. And finally, I will be a little bit critical not too much critical, as I used to be, um, about also some issues that Code Project is experiencing in a, in a local, in a mi on a micro level, still um, having some, I would say, good signs of improvement from what we consider as a successful e-participation projects 20 years ago and what we consider now. So the standards and expectations has risen and risen and also the results of EU found that the participation projects are, in my opinion, uh, getting uh, better. So now I hope this introduction... Is this okay? This is okay for me. If you can just uh, make a bit... There we go. Perfect. Robert won't be able to see it, but we'll... Robert won't be able to see it, but, uh, but I hope that's so not I a can move okay. like this. Yes, okay. or just from here. Okay. Okay, start with, with the first... Um, start with, with the, with the uh, first mention. Here you can see the, how the United Nations are measuring e-participation development on the global scale. Um, you can see Bulgaria is ranking 29 on the global scale of e-participation, uh, which is similar to Slovenia, there I come to. And, but don't be um, misled because there are so many countries on the planet being green. So meaning the more green color you have, the better in e-participation you are. But anyway, I would like to point out that this index is measuring three dimensions. One is information, access of the citizens to public information online provided by the government. Then we have uh, e-consultation involving citizens in policy making, which is connected to the, what crowdsourcing is um, in a sense um, about, and also e-decision making, me meaning co-creating uh, public policies. So, 
as this, con as this index sounds quite interesting, however, it has some, I would say, quite serious limitations. If you look deeply into the first 25 countries on the list of being most e-participation e developed countries, you can see some very exotic countries which are not really considered in democratic theory as being democratic political system. You have Saudi, you have Saudi, um, have uh, Emirates, Saudi and Emirates, um, just on the 20 spot. Then you have Kazakhstan a little bit better. You have China on 13 level. So this raises a huge question of how United Nations are actually measuring the e-participation because e-participation should be relating to what democratic practice is about. So what we can conclude from this one is that actually the United Nations are, are measuring the existence of online tools of e-participation, meaning if the country has this tool and that tool and that tool, okay, it is good in e-participation, but they do not measure the actual democratic impact of those tools, how those tools are um, improving the democracy in those countries, which is a kind of technocratic approach to e-participation. What I think is the added value of the code project here is that uh, we develop under the work package of, um, of, of e-participation assessment framework, which was led by Christina from the e-governance academy from um, Estonia, a very comprehensive framework how to think e-participation beyond just putting tools online. And we I really enjoyed being part of this work package. So Christina, thank you very much for leading us. Uh, we develop a set of successful um, factors with, which, which we think based on the analysis of many European practices in e-participation, what should be the success factors that make crowdsourcing project online a successful one. And I hope the United Nations will look at these uh, success factors and try to incorporate it in their e-participation index um, measurement. So this is what I see as this meta um, contribution of the code project to the e-participation. So now go to the meso level on the, e on the democratic models. We all know that there is no single model of democracy. Usually contemporary democracies are a mixture of different democratic models in the modern countries. Some countries are more into a representative type of democracy. Switzerland, for example, is more into direct. But usually, even if you, if you look at the, of the Constitution of Europe, um, uh, or uh, there are two models of uh, democracy, political democracy being embedded there. One is representative type of democracy, which is uh, highlighted by European elections. And then is this participatory part of democracy, which was Asia already mentioning, which opens the space for institutionalizing the crowdsourcing mechanism. Uh, what I would like to also share another dimension here is that uh, why is crowdsourcing so different from other e-participation techniques that actually it combines different parts of different uh, democratic models. What we have, what uh, Robert was describing, those four phases, we have the first phases of actually pulling uh, the opinions from citizens, which is, you can see, often uh, being part of the, this legalist, elitist um, democracy, which is trying to get informed citizens on board. Then we have in this second stage, um, we have selecting proposals from the government, uh, from the citizens, how would they solve the solutions, which is a kind of very broad terms relating to the online forums, which is already more into this participatory part of democracy. We also have this uh, voting then on those best proposals and of course the uh, policy formulation, which goes in a, broadly speaking, it covers different elements of what we see as involving citizens into democratic decision making. Oops, I just, okay. So uh, to conclude this me meso level of democracy, um, as you already, highlighted the EU crowd project, which was preceding the code project, and where the crowd sourcing is actually fitting into democratic policy cycle. We identified these two phases, and I think also the code project then take it further in terms of developing those four um, applications, uh, online tools. Um, I hope that the, the Robert would present those tools in terms of visualizing a few slides, but so that we have a better um, impression how those things take place online, how the communication uh, took place. 
Um, so I also see here on this meso level uh, the contribution of the of the code project because it's actually piloted. But we consider, at least in theory, that it could be a kind of um, added value of crowdsourcing to enhance democratic decision making and also involve citizens in policy making. Now I go to the um, a little bit more critical viewpoints. In 2011, uh, there was a very interesting um, article published um, analyzing uh, those early examples of e-participation, EU-funded uh, projects, which was a part of the e-participation action plan. And, and this article find out that if we take together all the EU funding that was mentioned for these um, projects and compare it with the number of the participations, online interactivity in terms of people signing online petitions, contributing to the online forum, so on. Um, the figure was that each of these interactions made online cost 550 euros of the European taxpayers' money. So, of course, this was purely only economical perspective on this, which is uh, very biased. But still, it makes a lot of people think, okay, we are throwing a lot of European money in what results. And this is very dangerous place for the populist and for the um, European captain taking those issues. Often we can see in public discourse and they say, okay, <clears throat> how effective is actually European Union and how effective is in technique in democratic deficit. But if we take this case on the, on the code project, we can see a lot of improvement. Not only because now we are living in a much more digitalized society than we lived 15 years ago, and it is much easier with same founding to engage much more people online. <clears throat> we also see that the applying the crowdsourcing practice is actually having more potential to engage citizens from different, into different policy cycles. And having uh, this kind of approach also makes things economically uh, more effective. And you can see, I just take some numbers from the <coughs> online from the website. And still, we have each user's contribution costed 307 euros um, of the European money. But however, I said, it's not about pure economy. What is about also is just, is I think this. What were the come outs is not only the numbers as a KPIs that we said we are going to involve such mass of citizens that we actually involved. It also provided, uh, I, I would say, um, a very important contribution to how we understand crowdsourcing that we are now talking about the blueprinting it into the institutionalized setting of the European Union. Because as Asia said, it's about learning by doing. And if you don't invest into democratic processes, if you don't invest in democratic um, innovations, if you don't experiment, even if you are a beginning you're having high, high costs, this is the usual practice of other in, in, um, investments that you are putting in other fields of development, you cannot progress. And that's why I think um, not only having this, I think very important e-participation assessment very framework which we really need to disseminate in, within the wider um, policy and scientific community. Also, we had a very good examples of how to use strategies for in, in involving citizens in those kind of projects. Burgas was a very good case because from previous analysis we had um, when having this um, e-participation assessment framework study cases, we noticed that it's a lot of e-participation projects are actually having difficulties with engaging people. Uh, this is something also I think that the code project is contributing to better practice how to engage citizens online in this grassroots uh, manner. And of course, um, policy recommendations, we can see that they're already rolling within the European Parliament decision makers. This is something which is also as important that uh, answering to this criticism, okay, there is some e-participation going on, but it's actually not really, really having um, policy impact. So uh, we saw today from the um, previous speakers that there are concrete things going on, which is very um, 
good thing. So now I will conclude with my last slide. Actually, already, uh, already um, Asia was highlighting some issues with uh, crowdsourcing. I just elaborated in a more broader sense. Um, still, we, have, we are facing this complex decision-making system and within the postmodern societies we are living it. It's not only one interest which is actually trying to impact in the decision-making. You have 10, 20 of interest. And now the problem with decision-maker is how do they balance those different interests, different competing social groups which have different values, which fight among each other, and decision makers itself, they should care for the general public interest. But if you have so many different interests, then what is the sum of the public interest? So I think one of the important things is that you communicate those different conflicts. And I think the crowdsourcing showcases it in the terms of the code project, how it is possible to communicate those different values, making it through different four phases to come into, from scratch into concrete policy legitimate policy proposal. And this also answers the second um, often criticized e-participation projects is that there's a lack of evidence of citizen impact. I'm really looking forward to what is going to come up from this parliamentary discussion on the air quality uh, topic. And also this is then consequently leading to also better trust into public institution. That's why I think this idea of institutionalized crowdsourcing can help you, not only European institutions, but also on the local level and uh, government level to try to address, to open the decision-making process. And by this, you can tackle this, what we have so-called protest participation. I will participate, but I am against. I'm against that, I'm against that, because as a citizen, I'm frustrated. And the only way I see the best way to participate is to be against, not to be for something or to propose something. And this is what crowdsourcing is actually doing. It is um, driving out the positive energy of citizens to contribute into a creative uh, way. And also, this is also a good, I would say, remedy for one of the remedies that we need to tackle uh, populism. And of course, and we are talking in digital communication. Now I will stop. I have only one, two minutes. Um, we also have to take into consideration the security and privacy of digital communication online. These are now huge issues which uh, came even more um, obvious after when we have this COVID pandemic and people stayed home and everything moved online. And there was increasing um, cyber security issues going on, uh, people being hacked or being um, facing with digital crime and so on. And also democratic processes has to be trustworthy, meaning that if I engage online, I have to be sure that uh, there is a security and privacy of my dat data and my personal communication. And of course, still digital divide, there are still segments of citizen society uh, groups uh, which are not having access, the equal access to the online technology. And that's why this, I don't know which one of speakers before me said, um, we still have to combine online and offline. And it also what actually came out with the code project with the partners on the local level or the, in the, the cities when those experiments took place, actually um, put a lot of effort in creating face-to-face -face workshop presentations and so on, which also contributed to the overall uh, output of the citizens. And one thing which actually everybody is dealing today, I would say with this, is a techno stress, meaning this being overwhelmed by digital technologies is something also that we have to consider um, that because e participation is what Robert said, is competing for the digital attention with other um, digital um, services, um, content and so on. So how we put those digital crowdsourcing on the higher level of attention from the citizens. This is something that probably also future project of crowdsourcing are going to explore. So that's all for me. Thank you, Simon. And thank you for your attention and thank I'm you. looking for a, a discussion. Um, I, as, as you've seen, I, I didn't keep the time as a moderator and we are already into the lunch break, but I thought it was really worth listening in detail everything that Simon had to tell us. And uh, if, you, if you would agree, I would uh, suggest that we start the discussion in our afternoon panel and go for lunch now. If you don't, if anybody, of course, if anybody has something very urgent that they need to say now, and especially keeping in mind that Robert is still in Zoom, we can still do that. But otherwise, I would suggest to go ahead with our um, 
program for the day, go have lunch and then move to Poda, see uh, the, uh, the amazing things that they're going to show us there, and then have time in the afternoon to continue the discussion and have our steering committee as well. What would you say? If everybody's for, let me just ask um, um, Robert if he's, he's, if he's still there. Robert? <laughs> All right. Then, that, then, that, then that's the answer to my question. Let's go and have lunch. And <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you. Um, special thanks to our crew from, uh, from the Bulgarian National Radio in Burgas, uh, to the people from the Flora Center who were helping us, and of course to our translator, interpreter, uh, for a very, uh, I think, convenient <laughs> meeting for everybody and making everything.